All right, hey everyone, how's it going? It's your brother Noah Hines. It's nice to see you guys again uh, in back in the next teaching. And in this video, we're going to be talking about the divine dilemma. We're pretty much going to be uh, raising the biggest question of the Bible, and that is why God cannot simply forgive sins. Many atheists or unconverted people might just think, well, when I die, can't just God forgive me if, uh, if God really is real or if Christianity really is real? Why can't jo God just forgive me? Or if I'm sorry or if I confess my sins, why can't just God forgive me on that basis? I find a lot of people really have that kind of thinking. Um, so we're going to be discussing that. And uh, this divine dilemma topic is so fundamental and important to understanding the atonement, which we're going to be getting more to more into next video. And uh, we're going to be talking about the problems of forgiveness. Uh, we're going to be talking about just a little bit about the problems of forgiveness. We'll be touching on it a little more in the next video as well, too. But the problems of forgiveness are governmental and they are not out of God's malicious anger or that he's so personally offended by sin. Uh, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter uh, 28. So some interesting places in the Old Testament. Um, obviously, I don't go to the Old Testament as much, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And we're going to be talking about the sanctions of the law as well, too. Any good government, uh, moral government, has sanctions of the law to influence morality and to prevent uh, crime. And that's what we're going to be kind of talking about a little bit first. Uh, so as you guys turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28, I first want to present you with a very interesting story, and this is a story of a king named Zeleucus in, um, in ancient Greece. I believe he was a king over ancient Greece uh, at one point, or at least somewhere in Europe. But anyways, uh, this King Zeleucus uh, had a very benevolent intent for his kingdom, and uh, he saw a problem arising in his kingdom that there were all these people committing adultery in his kingdom. So he set forth a law, King Zeleucus did, and he said, if any man is caught, caught committing adultery, both of their eyes are going to be plucked out with a hot, um, a hot poker. So obviously, you know, the kingdom was, uh, was, you know, going to see if this was actually going to happen, if the king was actually going to enforce this very uh, strict, this very weighty uh, penalty. And then before you know it, people were still committing adultery. And then uh, soon before you know it, people's eyes starting to get, are starting to get plucked out. So that was then communicating to his kingdom, hey, uh, King Zeleucus really means what he's saying. He's he's punishing people. He's plucking out their eyes because they're committing adultery. And obviously uh, that would uh, halt, that would influence to stop committing adultery because obviously you don't want to, you don't want to lose your eyes. But then a very big problem arose for King Zeleucus. Uh, the next person that was dragged before the courtrooms that had committed the crime was his own son. So now you can imagine, I hope you're making the connection that King Zeleucus is, is in this pretty big problem. He wants to enforce the penalty that he said is going to happen if you commit adultery. He wants to communicate to, that to his kingdom, even if it's his own son. You know, he wouldn't want to be biased. He wouldn't want to be a respecter of persons and just say, oh, well, this person gets a freebie pass. And then, you know, that would de, uh, that would, that would hurt the character of King Zeleucus. That would hurt the trustworthiness, you know, that would really, um, break down his reputation as a, as a king, you know, um, but uh, anyway, so he came up with this alternative. He came up with this substitution where he was going to have one of his own eyes plucked out and one of his son's eyes plucked out. So the fulfillment of kind of what was supposed to be happening in a roundabout way as far as the punishment still happened, uh, but yet he was still able to have compassion upon his son in a sense. And that's kind of really the gist of what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of videos that uh, God was in this situation as well too, where he has um, said that he's going to inflict punishment that on the soul that sinneth it shall die but at the same time he has this father's heart of compassion towards humanity he has this this love where he has this disposition of mercy that he wants to shed abroad upon mankind but the reason why he cannot just readily forgive everybody even though his heart his disposition of his heart would want him to is that there's problems in the way of forgiveness because forgiveness in that of itself 
influences uh, crime, influences disobedience. And I hope that becomes a little more clear to you guys as we continue on down with this video. But now we're going to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28, starting in verse 1. And I just want you to keep that story of King Zeleucus in the back of your mind as we go throughout this video and the next couple ones, um, or in the next couple videos. But Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 says, And it shall come to pass that if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on, a high, uh, on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed thou shalt be in the field. So uh, you see God is, is influencing them to live a life of holiness. He's saying, you're going to be blessed. You know, you're going to be blessed like crazy. Everywhere you go, if you hearken unto my voice, if you keep my commandments, you're going to have all of these blessings coming. But then we see down in, uh, uh, in verse 15, uh, it goes on to say of Deuteronomy chapter 28, But if it shall come to pass, if thou shalt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all the commandments, his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. So it's very important to understand that if everybody obeyed God, there would be blessings for everybody. There would be universal happiness if everybody obeyed Jesus Christ and, and kept his commandments and loved their neighbor and had that benevolent love where they loved their neighbor and loved God. But we see uh, that there is a you know, a result of doing disobedience. There's a, a bad result of doing sin, um, and there's going to be punishment thereof. So there's reward for, um, for obedience. There's reward and influence for obedience in a good moral law, and uh, there is punishment for disobedience in a good moral law to influence morality, to influence uh, happiness, and you know, in the society or in the kingdom. And then uh, the 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 infliction of punishment is to prevent and detour sin, detour crimes. And that's very important to understand as we go forth, and also to understand that God does not punish sin arbitrarily, and He also blesses for our benefit and for the benefit of His own kingdom. It's so important to understand that God does not punish because he's so personally offended or that he's bloodthirsty, but he punishes as a sin deterrent. As, as we go forth, that's very important to understand. You think about a criminal in this world, you know, when he breaks the law and he's before the court, he's thinking to himself, man, I hate all of these laws. These laws are just so unjust. I wish none of them were in place. Uh, you know, all drugs should just be legal. Drinking and driving shouldn't be that bad of a punishment behind it and so forth. Um, and it's the same thing with the sinner. Um, when he breaks God's law, he thinks God's law is just so oppressive. He thinks the commandments of Jesus are just ridiculous and, and unfair and stupid and all of these things. But it's very important that we have a mind shift when we come to Christianity, when we become a follower of Jesus Christ and a child of God, that we don't have this mindset that God's punishment is just so malicious or that it's unfair or that it's unjust, but God actually punishes for good reason, not just because he wants to punish. He actually has a disposition of mercy. He says, why will you die? Turn from your wicked ways. And that's so important to understand. It's important to understand also that a good judge punishes to uphold order in a society and the law of the land. So God would actually be unjust an unjust judge, if he did not punish the wicked, if he says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, and does not punish, or does not have an atonement, which is what we're going to talk to, a substitute for uh, the punishment, then it would actually be him going back on his word. He said, these people, you know, liars and um, and, 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 and whoremongers and sorcerers are going to go to the lake of fire if they commit these sins, but then they end up not going to the lake of fire. Well, then he is actually in that of itself would be encouraging disobedience, would be encouraging lawlessness because then you know, his, his, um, his promise of infliction of punishment then becomes that of mere advice, or he doesn't really fulfillment when he said it'll come to pass. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go down. But like I was saying, God has this disposition of mercy, but yet at the same time, he punishes people. Second Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness. But as long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? So you can just kind of see the heart of God springing forth there, that he does not want to see the wicked die. He does not want to see the wicked punished. But if they're not going to turn from their sins, and there's, excuse me, there's no substitute or uh, substitute for the, the, the punishment, then they're going to have to uh, suffer that, even though that's not ultimately uh, God's initial, that's not his initial will, that's not his heart's desire. Uh, it's important to understand that God delights in mercy, and judgment is his, his, his strange work. God would not have to be, um, you know, angry with the wicked every day, and he would not have to display forth his wrath if mankind just obeyed God and not did uh, and did not break His commandments. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about that a little later as well, too. But I wanted to drive home this point that in uh, moral government and the sanctions of the law, whether we're going to have um, the punishment or, or or the blessings of what God commands us, it's it's ultimately up to us. Deuteronomy 39, uh, 30, 19 says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursing. Therefore choose life that uh, that both thou and thy seed may live. So he's saying he wants everybody uh, to choose life. Um, he does not want people, he doesn't just like predestine the majority of humanity to, to sin. He doesn't cause them to sin, but he's saying, I want you uh, to choose life. And he ultimately puts it up in our hands, whether we're going to choose life or choose death. Uh, when we choose to be sinners, God must punish us. When we choose to break God's law, he must punish us. Not necessarily because he wants to, but because he is a just judge. Because he needs to maintain order in his universe and fulfill the punishment which he said that he, he would. Otherwise, then he would be going back on his word, like I was saying earlier. So it's important to understand as well, too, that if you choose good things, good things are going to happen. And if you choose bad things, if you choose sin, punishment and cursings are going to follow along with that. I have this quote here about... Um, about just general moral law in general, and it says, the severity of punishment is a reflection of the government's estimation of the value of the law. So with the severity, with the amount of severity that a government or a king chooses to inflict punishment, that's how much it, it, it shows that he values his law. If God is going to punish the wicked with everlasting destruction, el everlasting hellfire, what does that communicate about his law? What does that communicate about the, you know, the moral law and the commandments of Jesus Christ that God really cares about the commandments of Jesus Christ that it's no light thing unto him so it shows the value of how much he really cares about it I remember uh, me myself when I was unconverted when I was uh, still lost I got caught with like uh, 24 grams of weed and uh, wax concentrated THC and uh, all the government gave me for that was uh, a light probation, I think like six month probation and a court case. And ultimately that had little to no effect upon me. That really did not uh, inflict fear upon me to, to turn from my, my law breaking and to stop smoking weed. I continued to, to smoke weed after that. It had no influence to stop me. So that really showed that the government had a low value on, on, the, on the law that was being broken, right? That they really didn't care all that much that, that the law that they uh, instilled was being broken. So like I was saying, with the severity of the amount of punishment, that shows how much the, the government really cares about order, that, that really cares about, you know, keeping order and, uh, and, and people not committing crimes within the society. Ecclesiastes uh, 8.11 says, Because sentence against evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the, heart of, uh, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So when justice is not uh, brought about, when there's no execution of the punishment of crimes, it says it's fully set in the, in the hearts of men to commit uh, sin, to commit uh, iniquity, or it's fully set in the hearts of men to do evil. So if man is, saying, is seeing oh, well, our government or even God is not inflicting punishment, then that's actually going to influence uh, disobedience. That's actually going to influence chaos in the society or in the kingdom. 
And that's in, important to understand as well, too. So crime spreads when justice is not executed. And the more strict punishment actually encourages morality that much more. So the more strict punishment that there's given for the, the breaking of a crime, it encourages morality that much more. Um, and light punishment or no punishment at all actually um, can influence lawbreaking, can influence lawlessness in a society. And um, I hope that you guys can understand from that, one of the primary purposes of punishment is to communicate a message. And we see this uh, with God as well, too, that he did certain things as an example for us. You know, you think about the flood of Noah, you think about Sodom and Gomorrah. We see in Second Peter and in Jude as well, too, that these things were done for our, our, an example, that we should not live an ungodly life, that God is going to punish those who continue on in their sin. So God did these numerous or other other things in the Old Testament to establish that he means business, that these are examples of what, the, what is communicating to his beings that God is going to punish sin. And he did these things for examples to, you know, show that he means business, that he really does care about his law, that he really does care about the commandments of which he gives us, the commandments of Jesus Christ. I remember, I think it was in India, I heard um, briefly about a report where there was this really big uh, problem of, of rape going on. And in India, the police officers were not inflicting uh, punishment upon the rapists. They were not, you know, they would get reports of, of women being raped and then the police officers would just kind of shake it off. They wouldn't go to, you know, seek out the criminals and to, you know, do justice and to put them in jail or put them in prison or whatever. And, um, the, the rape uh, rates, if I believe, if I remember right, the uh, the amount of rape that was happening actually continued uh, to increase. So it's not only the threat of punishment, but also the execution of punishment that deters people away from crime, that deters people away from sin. Because just merely... Um, just merely uh, saying that you're going to punish something and not actually doing it, never doing it, in that of itself actually once again encourages uh, disobedience, encourages crime. Um, and that's important to understand. So what is communicated about when there's no punishment of a crime? When a kingdom, a king, or a government says that if you do these things, there's going to be punishment. If they don't inflict that punishment, it either communicates that the government does not care about the law or that the law was unjust or that it was too severe. If they're not inflicting a very just um, recompense of reward for the crime that was committed, it either, like I said, communicates that really the kingdom doesn't care, the government doesn't care, or that the law in that of itself was actually unjust or too severe, or the kingdom really just doesn't care. So there's a higher reason for punishment besides just merely because somebody deserves it. It's to ensure public justice. And we're going to be talking about that concept of public justice a little more as we go throughout the, the future teachings. But, um, it's the same thing with God, right? With our government, and you know, you think about judges, the judges might want to forgive, but there's a higher reason at hand why they want to inflict punishment that's to ensure public justice, that there's not chaos going on in the society. And uh, same thing with God. God has a disposition of mercy. He's readily available. He's readily uh, uh, ready to forgive mankind, but because there's a higher reason of punishment, there's there's justice that needs to be maintained. There's order that needs to be maintained. He will still punish those who continue on in their in their impenitence, those who continue on uh, living a life of sin. So this really gives a revelation about God that God hates sin so so much. If God is going to throw the wicked into hell fire forever, into the lake of fire forever, this communicates that God hates sin. And if God hates sin, that shows that He loves righteousness. If He really hates sin, if if he's going to punish sin, that's, that's so much. It also, on the other side of the coin, communicates that he really loves righteousness, that he really loves holiness, that he really loves order being maintained in his kingdom and his, in, his, in his society. So this makes sense now to the understanding of why this all sins are equal uh, doctrine is, is complete garbage, because there needs to be a more strict um, infliction of punishment for a, a greater crime. 
And we see this even in, in our governments on this world as well, too, that if you get a speeding ticket as opposed to murdering somebody, that might be like a level five crime as opposed to a level 500 crime. There, you know, there's going to, there should be, uh, by justice, there should be a greater infliction of punishment. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty four says, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for thee. So once again, kind of like I was touching on, penalty in God's government is a sin deterrent and not merely because God has malicious anger, not because God has malicious, arbitrary uh, anger. Now, yes, God is angry with the wicked every day, but he's angry for governmental purposes, not because it's his good pleasure to be angry towards sin, not because... He uh, delights in the punishment of the wicked, but his, you know, his, uh, his, his anger and his wrath are of that out of necessity to maintain order in his universe. Like I was saying before, if man had never committed sin, then God would not have to, you know, be wrathful. He would not have to be uh, angry, right? So one thing, other thing that I wanted to touch on is precept without penalty is mere advice. This is why easy believism or once saved, always saved has lowered the commandments of Jesus Christ to mere advice. If there's no uh, blessing for a reward or if there's no punishment for disobedience, then it's just merely advice. And that's what people have done to the teachings and the words of Jesus Christ that, oh, if you disobey this teaching, nothing's really going to happen. You still can go into the kingdom of God. When Jesus said, you know, he he who commits sin is a is a slave to sin, well, that's just kind of this, you know, mind state sort of thing. But if you, you know, if you believe, if you have this mental assent, then you're just perfectly fine to continue on in your sin. And, uh, you know, they take the, G, the, the commandments of Jesus, the laws, uh, and the moral law and the commandments of Jesus Christ, and they bring them down to mere advice. And uh, if there's no infliction of punishment and there's no... Um, and there's no reward for um, obedience and morality, then the law becomes mere advice. Then the commandments of a king become mere advice. And uh, this is why one reason, one of many reasons, why easy believism could never be true, why once saved, always saved could never be true. Um, and just for the fact of another reason, if you could continue on in your sin and make it into heaven, well, then uh, heaven's going to end up looking like Dante's Inferno pretty quick, and it's not going to be so much uh, heaven anymore if God allows all these people that love their sin, that are continuing on in, in their drunkenness and drugging and masturbating and all of these different things into his kingdom. You have to understand that sin is a crime in the eyes of God. That's especially important in this area of study of moral government theology, that sin is actually a crime. It's breaking God's uh, moral laws, breaking the moral commandments of Jesus Christ. First John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. Now, this is not the only definition of sin, which some people kind of try to limit it to, to. Also, the Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin, uh, and numerous other places that you could go to for uh, definitions of sin. But I particularly wanted to look at this definition that sin is a crime, and it's a crime so horrible that it must be punished with hell fire. Sin is such an offense to the kingdom of God and to, uh, to Jesus Christ and to God that it must be punished with hell fire to maintain order in God's universe. And because it's such a terrible crime, it must be punished with hell fire. And you also need to take into consideration in this discussion that sinning is not just only against God, but it's sinning against God's kingdom. It's sinning against God's moral subjects. It's promoting a lawlessness in God's universe abroad. Luke 15, 21 says, And the Son said unto the Father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy Son. So this individual was realizing that he did not only sin against God, but that there was a ripple effect to his sin that was affecting other people as well sin too. So sin really is so terrible. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Oftentimes when that's said nowadays, it's kind of communicated in a, in a cliche type way, but you have to take it into the consideration that we've all committed evil crimes in the eyes of God that are worthy of the punishment of hell fire. Uh, so 
yes, there's obviously, you understand now that out of God's justice, he, he, he has to inflict punishment. Out of that, in, in that of itself, aside from an, an atonement and aside from repentance, there has to be this infliction of punishment. So there's problems in the way of forgiveness. God cannot just forgive all of mankind, even though he might be so readily uh, ready to within his heart, within his disposition. Uh, two major reasons why God cannot just simply forgive sin, which we've kind of been talking about, is if he let people that are continuing on into, in, in sin into heaven, heaven would be turned into something like that of Dante's Inferno. It would be corrupting God's kingdom. And as well, too, if God just merely forgave men in that of itself, God would be going back on his word of punishment. He said, the soul that sinneth it shall die and uh, if the soul that sinneth it doesn't die then that you know that's not being fulfilled you know the law the commandment that god gave there is not being fulfilled um now i wanted to go over some scriptures that prove that god is is readily available he's readily ready to forgive mankind if uh, if the right conditions are met there needs to be conditions on god's end and on our end as well too that need to be met but i wanted to talk about god's disposition of forgiveness micah 7:19 says he will turn again and he will have compassion upon us he will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea ezekiel 6:9 says because i'm broken with their whorish heart which has departed from me and their eyes which uh, go a whoring after their idols and they shall loathe themselves for all the evils which they have committed in all of their abominations so once again you can just see this heart of god where he's 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 broken at heart he his heart is literally broken is saying right here over the sin of man that man is rejecting him so it's very important to understand that it's not that god rejects the majority of mankind but the majority of mankind has rejected god he's saying right here that he's he's broken over over his people that have rejected them and continue on in their sin Psalm 103, 10 through 12 says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. So God is looking for a man that has repent. He's drawing a man to repentance. He's commanding all men everywhere to repent. And he's, he's so ready to forgive mankind if they would just repent. If they would just humble themselves before the Lord Jesus Christ, he would throw their sins into the sea of forgetfulness. And I believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. That he wants all men everywhere to repent because he commands all men everywhere to repent. So I hope you guys are really starting to get this concept, this, this, this divine dilemma that's going on, where God has this heart of compassion. He wants to forgive mankind, but at the same time, he has an obligation as a king to maintain order in his universe. God cannot forsake his kingdom, um, his kingdom principles, his kingdom uh, maintaining order in his kingdom and his obligation to do so merely based upon his fatherly feelings. So in order for him to express those fatherly feelings of forgiveness, there needs to be a substitute for the, the crime. There needs to be a substitute for the sin that was committed so that God can, instead of inflicting punishment upon us, there can be a substitute for that. And uh, that gets into the discussion of the atonement, which we'll be getting more into. I hope it's starting to become clear for you guys. Like I said, in Ezekiel 18.20, it's, or like I said earlier, um, in Ezekiel 18.20, it says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Let's say, for an example, you get home from a day of work and uh, you, you come home to realizing that there's an assassin inside of your house and he murdered your entire family. And as you uh, walk through the door, he's draining the life out of your last child. And then uh, you want to kill him as well, too. Uh, but you restrain yourself and then you do like a, you know, a citizen's arrest on him or what have you. And uh, you end up bringing him. Uh, he gets arrested and then he has his day of trial. He has his day where he stands before the judge and the judge says well i'm a gracious and merciful judge i'm ready for to forgive sin you know I, i'm gonna have compassion upon this individual i'm gonna forgive all of their sin i'm gonna forgive this assassin that just murdered your family um i'm gonna forgive their sins because i'm a gracious judge well you would be in an uproar hopefully you would be furiously angry and say 
this judge is a worse criminal than even the crime uh, than than even the uh, the assassin that murdered my family. And that's so important to understand that forgiveness in that of itself would actually encourage disobedience, would actually encourage a uh, crime. You would call that judge an unjust judge. You would be furious with that judge if there was nothing in place of the punishment that he deserved. In that of itself, the forgiveness is a very delicate thing, guys. The mercy of God, the mercy of Jesus Christ is such a delicate thing. When God forgives our sins, it's such a grace, gracious thing because forgiveness really communicates a lot of things. That's why we don't see forgiveness really going on in our human governments because, you know, human government can't reconcile. Well, how can we maintain order? How can we maintain, you know, the laws that we have in our government, but yet have mercy upon this individual at the same time? Where mercy uh, starts, there's no longer punishment. And uh, where punishment starts, there's no longer mercy. You can't have both at the same time in that of, its, in that of itself. Or you can't have both at the same time in general, I should say. Um, so humanity's sin has put God in this catch-22 where he wants to forgive mankind's sin. He wants to forgive all of mankind, but at the same time, if he did so, think about what that would communicate to the angels, to the demons, to all of mankind. It would communicate that God doesn't care about his law, that God doesn't care about the commandments that he commanded us. He doesn't care about the punishment that he promised uh, to inflict. So like I was saying before, forgiveness in and of itself encourages rebellion and encourages crime. Exodus 34, 7 says, maintaining loving devotion to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means excuse the guilty. So this verse, if you really look at it, I hope you look at it for yourself. It's a very important verse. It seems kind of contradictory. Hey, God is saying that he's not going to uh, forgive. He's not going to excuse the guilty by any means. But at the same time, he's saying he forgives all kinds of sin. He forgives iniquity, sin, transgression. It's bundled all together to communicate that God forgives all kinds of sins, right? But right after that, it says, yet he will by no means excuse the guilty. How can you reconcile the one to another? It's found in the atonement of Jesus Christ. And I hope that you're seeing the similarities now with the story that I gave about King Zeleucus with, um, with God as well, too. So, some might ask, how can God have a problem? How can God have this divine dilemma? Well, then I would ask back to that, then why would there be an, an atonement for a solution? Why would God need to send his son if he could just readily forgive mankind and he didn't have any problems in the way of forgiveness? If God just could have forgiven everybody, then why did he have to send his son? He had to send his son so that uh, some of the conditions of forgiveness were met. You know, there needs to be an, an atonement and repentance. Um... Uh, let's see, I wanted to go to Daniel chapter 6 to give another illustration uh, from the Bible about this situation that will hopefully really drive home this point with another illustration to you guys. So we're going to be in Daniel chapter 6, uh, just starting in verse 1. It says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over uh, three presidents of whom Daniel was first, the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above all the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. Because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So these other princes and presidents did not like Daniel, so they're like, we're going to try and find some sin or some crime that he's doing in order to accuse him. And then it goes on to say in verse 5, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of God. God. Then these presidents and princes assembled them, assembled together to the king and said uh, thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All, uh, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted, uh, consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a pension of any god or man for thirty days, Save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So I hope you can see 
what these individuals are trying to do, they're trying to conspire against Daniel to get the king to sign this to decree that if any man's praying to a god, if any man's praying to, to, to God, that, um, that they're going to be cast into the den of lions. And it goes on to say in... Um, in verse 8, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius, sign the writing and the decree. Now, uh, then, Daniel knew the writing was signed, and he went into his house and windows being open. Uh, in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. So now they've got Daniel. Daniel's openly praying and, you know, he's got his window open and these, these people have caught Daniel. They've caught Daniel in this crime against the new law that was just instilled. Um, and it goes to say... Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a pension of, of any god or man within thirty days, save thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree which thou hast signed, but maketh his pension three times a day. Then the king, which uh, when he heard these words, he was sore displeased with himself, and he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. These men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, King, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is, that no decree nor statue which the king established may be changed. Then the king commanded that they be brought uh, that they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of the lions. Now the king spake unto the king of Dan, uh, unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and, and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed with his own signet and with his own signet of his lords, that the purpose might be uh, might not be changed concerning Daniel. So you can just see that I hopefully uh, hopefully you can see that this king wanted to deliver Daniel. He didn't want to inflict the punishment of the crime upon Daniel. He he labored till the going down of sun uh, of the sun, but he couldn't find any substitute. He couldn't find any atonement that would be in place. Of, of the crime that Daniel had committed. So then thus out of obligation of necessity to maintain order, to maintain justice of the law that was in place, he, he went on to uh, put Daniel in the lion's den. He had to do so out of justice. He could not forsake his disposition, or he could not forsake justice just because upon his heart of disposition of mercy. Um, because everybody's saying, hey, you can't change this law. The law alters not. You need to inflict the punishment that was um, that was promised along with if somebody commits this crime. So I hope you see the divine dilemma really clear that God is, is readily available to forgive mankind. It's not as though he just predestined a majority of mankind to enter into hellfire uh, or predetermined that, but actually that that God wants all of mankind to be saved, that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but because he's a just judge, because he wants to maintain and needs to maintain order in his universe, he's going to punish the wicked. And he actually would have to punish all of mankind with hellfire, even if they did repent. You see, repentance is not merely just enough. And maybe we'll talk about that a little more in a future video, but it's not just by repentance because there's still a uh, crime that would, or there's still a punishment for the crimes that were committed in the past or the crimes that were committed in general that needs to be inflicted. So there's the Socinian view that would say, oh, just repentance is needed. Or like in Islam, they just think that, you know, Allah can forgive you if you just merely repent of your sins. But just repentance is not enough because God said that if you commit these crimes, regardless if you repent or not, there needs to be this punishment inflicted. And what would mankind, what would everybody think, what would all of God's creation think if God forgave people merely just based upon uh, repentance of sins? 
is that, hey, we can just go do all of these wicked things, and if we repent of our sins after, then we'll, we'll be perfectly fine. And uh, once again, I think that's what a lot of people think uh, unconverted and maybe even some converted as well too. So just repentance is not enough. Repentance is a condition for mercy, but it's not enough. It's not enough uh, for there to be just forgiveness. There needs to be something in substitute. There needs to be something in place of the crime or of the punishment of the crime that was promised when an individual uh, breaks a law. So I hope you guys meditate upon all of the things that I've been saying to you. I realize it might be a little bit of a deeper topic, but uh, it's so essential to really get this down. This is pretty much the major question of the Bible of why can't God just forgive sins? And he had to send his son so that he could forgive uh, sins. Jesus said this is the, the blood of the New Testament that is shed for the remission of sins, that is shed for the, remish, uh, for the forgiveness of sins. And in the next video, we're going to be talking a little bit about the, the nature of forgiveness as well, too, about what forgiveness really is and what forgiveness is not, because in modern theology, forgiveness is really distorted. Uh, but I hope that you guys are blessed, and I hope to see you guys in the next teaching. Be blessed in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen.